So I am Francesca's agent and I've been Francesca's agent for gosh, like eight years, I think something like that. But this is my first time interviewing her. So I'm going to try not to go rogue. So hopefully I will get invited back for a second time uh, to interview her. So Francesca Haig is a novelist, poet and academic. She is the author of the Fire Sermon trilogy, a post-apocalyptic series published in more than 20 languages. Her first collection of poetry was Bodies of Water. She grew up in Tasmania, gained her PhD from the University of Melbourne and now lives in London. So Chess, can you tell us a little bit about the Cookbook of Common Prayer for those who obviously have ordered their copies ready but haven't had a chance to read it yet? Uh, I can. Can I first say thank you to, uh, to everyone who's come along? I know we're all sick to death of Zoom. I also am sick of Zoom. Um, that's why I'm in my pyjamas because I thought I'd just lean in to the whole having to have a book launch on Zoom experience. So um, I really appreciate you all coming along at the end of a pandemic when I know we all have Zoom fatigue. Um, yeah, so the Cookbook of Common Prayer um, is a novel about a family, a Tasmanian family. Um, and I think we might talk a bit more about that later. Um, and Jill and Gabe have three children and the middle daughter, Sylvie, who's in her teens, is um, horribly unwell with eating disorders that have seen her hospitalized for years. And then um, their elder child, their eldest child, uh, Dougie, dies in a horrible freak caving accident um, in his gap year in the UK. And Gabe and Jill are terrified of how Sylvie will cope with this news. And so they make the, the frankly terrible decision uh, not to tell her. And they um, begin to maintain this increasingly elaborate pretense for Sylvie's benefit that, Gabe, uh, that Dougie is still alive. And Dougie used to write to Sylvie regularly in her hospital. Um, and uh, Jill, the mother, begins to um, to forge these letters and continue that correspondence. Um, but as this continues and they all become more and more deeply enmeshed in this, um, this lie, it becomes increasingly clear that, um, that they may be lying to protect themselves. And meanwhile, their slightly neglected younger son, um, Teddy, who's only 11, is trying to find a way to, to find out what made his sister Sylvie sick in the first place and to find a way to, to bring his family together. But um, he's, he's very on his own in that quest and it could bring them together or it could really be the final nail in the coffin for that family. Well, that's a great pitch and it's been lovely to see already. We've had a brilliant review on Love Reading um, and a great review from Prima as well. So very excited for people to read it. Uh, we've touched upon the fact that it's set in Tasmania and obviously you uh, are from Tasmania. So um, the sense of place feels quite integral to the novel. I've never visited Tasmania, I'll be honest, but I felt I got quite a strong sense of what it's like and what it must be like to live there from the novel. Why did you decide to set it there? And also, do you think the novel would have been different had you set it in London, for example, or in America? And how much of a conscious choice was it? Um, it was a it was a very deliberate choice. Um, I felt like I'd been writing around Tasmania for a long time. Um, yeah. I, mean, I, I haven't lived in Tassie since I was 17. That's when I, I left home and I haven't lived there since then. And when I was 17, like so many other young Tasmanians, I just couldn't wait to get out. You know, to me, Tasmania <laughs> was so backward and boring and incestuous and, and everyone knows everyone. It can feel very claustrophobic. Um, but it's the kind of place that once you leave, you then, you realize that you spend your rest of your life trying to get back there. Um, and it's so beautiful and it is odd. It's not, it's not a very straightforward kind of beauty. There, there is this claustrophobic sense. It's a very island vibe. Um, so it's not uncomplicated and it has this incredibly dark history. I mean, Australia as a whole has this horrible history in terms of how it treated um, the First Nations people of Australia and Tasmania, um, did that in its own particularly gruesome ways um, during the colonial period and, and since then. Um, so it's a place that is very, very beautiful, but it never feels like a really, the, the wilderness in Tasmania is not, um, it's not safe. It's not mm -hmm. idyllic. It's certainly nothing like the English pastoral that I've got used to over here. Mm -hmm. um, 
so I've been trying to come to terms with and, and think about and write my way through my feelings about Tasmania for a long time. And in my earlier books, um, there was a place that was an island. It was a much smaller island and it wasn't based on Tasmania, but I think I was still hung up on ideas of islands. Um, mm -hmm. And for this one, I think I just turned full on and thought, I can't run away from this anymore. I actually have to write the Tassie book now. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just Tasmania. I mean, the family does live in Hobart, but the real core of the story is this place, an hour and a bit's drive um, out of Hobart, which is um, Eagle Hawk Neck on the Tasman Peninsula, which is a tiny little neck of land that connects a peninsula to Tasmania. So it's sort of an island off an island off an island. Mm -hmm. So it has its own very unique feeling. It's an incredibly liminal place. Um, and, and I spend a lot of time there as a as a child and, and love it very fiercely, but also I'm slightly afraid of it because it's it's a properly wild place and there are bushfires and there are sort of sharks and steep cliffs and a horribly dark history. Um, so I'm just fascinated by this place. There's an incredibly beautiful um, poem by Margaret Scott, who's a, an expat English um, author who lived in Tasmania. And she writes a poem about Tasmania and she actually lived on the Tasman Peninsula herself. And she calls it, she talks about how the ghosts haunt this place of unremembered graves. And I've sort of had that line running through my head a long time. Um, this is a very haunted place. Um, and so it, while it's very beautiful and it's very precious to the family and they have these in many ways idyllic family holidays there um, at a family beach house, it's also a place that holds a lot of secrets and a lot of dark history. And so the family keeps being drawn back there to face their past. Mm -hmm. um, so I couldn't have transplanted it to anywhere else. It's not that the, the location is a vehicle for the story. The location in many ways is the story. I sound like one of those terrible reviews of Sex in the City when they inevitably <laughs> say the city of New York is the fifth character. Um, <laughs> but, but I hope it is true. Um, for the novel and actually it's interesting to hear you Juliet say that the play struck you because something that that really nudged me in that direction is in an earlier draft that I sent to Juliet um, as as an agent she's she's very insightful with editorial comments and and a criticism you had of a sort of glimpse of a very early draft you said this could take place anywhere yeah and I really dialed up then the sense of place um, which was a joy it wasn't it wasn't a chore it was like oh yeah that's obviously what I need and it was such a pleasure to lean right in and kind of wallow in all those memories. It's not an autobiographical novel, but the place is very, very dear to me. Um, but it's been funny finalising and publicising this novel at a time when I feel really far away. Yeah, of course. Um, you haven't been back for a long time now. Ages. And a special shout out to my parents in Tasmania, who at 4.30am Australian time are currently logged on to this call hi mum that that is commitment that's and that's so lovely hi <laughs> so lovely that they're here um that that is really interesting I think that well the original title of the book was down in the boneyard wasn't it so I I guess that idea of a kind of haunted space and a place that you know li quite literally there are dead bodies in this book but also there are a lot of bodies in terms of their family secrets that are buried that no one really looks at they just kind of merrily skip over them as if like there's a corpse down there but we're, if we don't look at it <laughs> it's fine I mean I did have several fairly ordinary titles on the way down in the boneyard in particular was actually a a, a quote from um the the incredible book we have always lived in the castle by Shirley Jackson because there's a rhyme there about down in the boneyard um and that was a, a sort of a reference not only to this haunted place but um but to the eating disorder that plagues Sylvie, the, the middle child of the family. Um, but, but I'm really glad in the end that we arrived at, at the title that we did, because I think it, it says more about the novel and the search for, for consolation and um, all the secular kinds of prayer that, that we undertake when we're just trying to find our way through. I agree. And, and that leads me quite naturally onto my next question, which was about food, because food, the preparing of it, eating it and ignoring it are quite critical to some of the novel's most powerful scenes. Um, and for Jill, it's one of the ways she shows love. It's, it's one of the ways she brings her family together. You know, like she makes these elaborate meals. Do you think 
Sylvie's rejection of her mother in this way is conscious? Do you think the rejection of her mother's food is about the rejection of her mother's love? And, and was that a deliberate thing that you, you wanted to get across how the two are tied? Yeah, the two are very intimately connected and, um, and food is really at the, at the heart of the book. Um, because Jill isn't just a, a cook, she's a food writer and a chef by profession. So she's done reasonably well as a food writer, it's her career. So um, for her daughter to become unwell and specifically to reject food, she can't help but take that very personally. Um, and Sylvie protests, you know, the kind of, oh God, mum, it's not about you, of a teenager, mm -hmm. it's not all about you. But of course it slightly is. We all yeah. have our own individual relationship with food. But of course, if your mother is a food writer, um, and an avid cook that's going to be, be loaded and, and entangled with your relationship with food. Um, and I was very interested in, in how we treat food in, in literature and, and in the culture more broadly, because there's, there's a kind of movement that I've watched with real wariness and concern, um, the kind of clean eating movement, which seems to have become just a very marketable and socially acceptable form of disordered eating. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and the other side of that is the kind of Instagrammable food where food has become very performative and, and showy. And, and I think what's getting lost between those two, um, those two tendencies is, is pleasure in food as a physical thing. And, um, and tied into that, of course, all the issues with disordered eating and all the pressures that people, particularly women, um, are under. So that, that's very central to the book. And, um, and I wanted to try and explore the way that that relationship with food exists. And Jill, Jill is a wonderful cook and she cooks for her family, but uh, it's, not, it's not really generosity because she wants something in, in return. It's an exchange. She, she wants her daughter's love and her daughter's acceptance. And so for a child to refuse that, she says, you know, how can, how can a food writer not take this personally? But I also think, you know, how can any mother yeah. separate themselves from their child? Mm -hmm. And I was also struck when I was um, pregnant and, and had my child reading a lot of kids' books and a line that really hit me from the beautiful children's classic, Morris Sendak's Where the Wild Things Are, is um, I'll eat you up, I love you so, because I think there is something very devouring mm -hmm. about... Um, maternal and, and parental love and also as someone who did it pretty tough in the breastfeeding trenches there's also something literally quite devouring about <laughs> a child's love for their parents so over the last few years of having a, a baby and top I was thinking about that um, and thinking about how we, we want to devour the things we love that love is not a gift often it's a demand that we place on people particularly on our children mm -hmm. um, I've just finished Catherine Angel's lovely little essay for Peninsula Press, um, Daddy Issues, and she talks about how difficult it is for a child to individuate and grow into a sense of themselves when their parents are demanding something back from them and are defining themselves through the child and, and their expectations of the child. So Jill and Sylvie have this very fraught relationship where Jill's desperate to feed Sylvie. And Sylvie, when she first begins to descend into anorexia, um, initially goes through a frenzy of baking and becomes a very, a very good baker. And she's constantly pressing food on her family. And once again, that's not, that's not true generosity because it's a, it's an assertion of control. You know, look how much self control I have. I won't eat any of this. You'll have more. You'll have seconds, won't you? And, it, and so food is very loaded with power dynamics. I think in this family. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm very interested in the way that we can find our way back to food as a source of. Um, of physical pleasure that isn't loaded with guilt and societal meaning. Um, I always think about when Nigella first burst onto the scene and one of the criticisms that was leveled at her was that she was playing up her sensuality or the sensuality of cooking. And it always seemed absurd to me, firstly, because Nigella, queen, protect her at all costs, but also more importantly, food is literally sensual you literally appreciate it at, with your senses so the idea that we've sort of become quite puritanical about food um always seems strange to me um so Jill does cook and initially um her cooking is a way of expressing her despair but it also becomes a way of communicating with with people she loves and when when she and Sylvie come to understand each other better the food has been a conduit for that understanding and 
one of the ways that Sylvie gets to know her mother better as she re-emerges into the world is, is that she's, she's tasted her mother's grief um, in her mother's food, that, that the food becomes a, a, a genuine means of communication and a, and a true gift of generosity at that point, rather than a, an expectation that's placed upon the child. Sure. Also, it's really hard to cook on a much more mundane level. <laughs> Well, I was going to say, you know, you mentioned Nigella Lawson. Do you do you have any particular favourite food writers? Like, who do you think um, writes well about food? I, from a from a sort of ideological point of view, I adore Ruby Tando. I just think that she's been the most wonderful, fresh voice in food writing that has has really forcefully said, "Eat what you want. Don't be tied up with guilt. It's all right for food to be a source of pleasure." That we get, particularly as women, when so many societal constraints are placed upon us, that mm -hmm. it's all right to recognise our appetites and um, and to embrace even greed. That that's okay. Um, so I love the joy and the lust and the um, embrace of appetite in Ruby Tando's food writing and also her attacks on the, the sort of classism and racism of so much of the food writing scene. And um, I, I really love um, and the, the person I cook from more often than anyone else. I mean, basically, to the exclusion of anyone else, are the, the roasting tray cookbooks from Rapmini Ia. I mean, I just I don't use anything else now. And she's very good about cooking in a way that isn't an imposition or a grand feast that actually meets us where we are and says it's a busy night and um, you know the finale of your favorite Netflix show is on and you want to cook something quickly that will not leave your kids hungry here's something that's really yummy so I love her um, I've also really enjoyed um, Ella Risbridge's writing in Midnight um, Chicken and on her in her online work and journalism about um, about the intersection of food and cooking and nurture and and mental health um so she's been a really interesting voice as well I think it's really interesting hearing you talk about food and how passionately you speak about you know how as women you know there's so much societal pressure on us and the way we eat and how important it is to just eat whatever you want enjoy what you're eating kind of revel in that earthly pleasure and then you've written a book about a woman with an eating disorder whose decision not to eat is crucial <laughs> to the book. Did you feel that there was a conflict between how you feel about food and, and kind of creating this character for whom food, food is a minefield? Um, no, not at all, because I would never judge um, someone who is subject to those pressures. Um, while I, you know, I now feel I'm in a really a place where I can quite comfortably um, condemn them um, and, and advocate for a, a different attitude to eating. I've been there and so many, I mean, I, it, it would be rarer amongst my female friends not to have been there, to have struggled with some form of disordered eating. Um, so I never approach Sylvie from a point of view of superiority or judgment. I very much understand because I think it's, it's almost inevitable that women do experience mm -hmm. that. I mean, she's further along the spectrum in terms of the extremeness of her illness. Um, but no, I think I understand her because I've, I've been her to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. um, and um, a member of my family suffered very badly from eating disorder for years. And while their story is completely different from Sylvie's and, and the book is in no way um, based on, on her story and, and it is, you know, all the other dramatic events um, and characters are, um, are completely fictional. I have sort of experienced quite deeply the the impact not just on the individual but also on the family yeah, of, course. of that horrible illness so um I felt quite um quite passionately that it's important to understand it not just to condemn it yeah of course um, and that by trying to get inside it I could also attempt to, well what I hope I did in this book is to um to, to never to glamorize because there's a real responsibility if you're writing about things that so many people particularly young women are still subject to um, though that demographic is of those suffering eating disorders is much broader than um, we sort of used to think when we used to think it was just a teenage girl's um, problem. Um, where was I going with this? That I, oh yes, that, um, because, because it's very real and very pressing and a very yeah. serious medical problem. I mean, um, eating disorders have the highest mortality rate for almost any mental illness. Um, mm -hmm. I, I felt that there was a real responsibility in terms of depicting that in detail, yeah, about not doing certain things, and about about really trying to depict the the very unglamorous, rather disgusting physical reality of that experience. Mm -hmm. um, and there are certain best practice guidelines about you know not not 
quoting particular methods or, or mm. detailing particular weights and so on. But um, no, I found I thought it was really important to try and, and do justice to this topic. And and Sylvie is um, is at the core of the novel, really. Yeah, um, that's that's something that you've said, which I thought was really interesting. That you know, she's she's a very kind of angry person and there's a lot of pain in her narrative it's, but it's it's very compelling but that you found her very hard to write but that she was to you the most important voice in the novel can you talk a little bit about how she was the most important voice to you and and why you did find it challenging I mean it's not surprising you found it challenging it's a hard thing to put yeah. yourself into the mind of a of a character who's going through something so extreme um the first time we encounter Sylvia in the novel, because the, the novel is told by um, different narrators, it sort of cycles through um, the chapters from Jill and Gabe, the, the mum and dad and Teddy um, and Sylvie. But the first time we get we get Sylvie's voice is simply a blank page. And um, amusingly, when we did the, the first copy edit, um, my, my brilliant publishers didn't realise, they kind of thought it was a mistake and the, the typesetter had removed it and I had to get in touch quickly and say, no, no, that page is really important. It's a kind of, this page has been intentionally left blank, like you get a yeah. exam. So it just says Sylvia and there's nothing because what's powerful about Sylvia in many ways and why she's difficult to write is not her, what she has to say, it's what she doesn't say because her power, the only power that she thinks is available to her is the power of withholding. Mm -hmm. So she doesn't eat. She doesn't enter into life and she doesn't really talk very much. She's, she's been really reluctant to speak very much. So it's trying to write compellingly from someone who is largely silent. Yeah. Um, but she, she's a really juicy character. She was to me because she's, she's highly intelligent. Um, and I can understand her logic, which is that to opt out, that there is a kind of power in that. And, and it takes a, a long time for her to realize that that is, is punishing herself first and foremost. If you opt out of food and communication and family, um, you punish everyone, but you punish yourself most of all. So for her to find her way back to language and back to food means that she has to, has to let go of this mechanism, which has been this incredibly powerful tool. Mm -hmm. and, but she's, she's deeply deeply intelligent and she and she loves to read so she discovers King Lear as a troubled young woman and just thinks I can't believe they're teaching this in school this isn't a play this is a hand grenade because this revelation when Cordelia says nothing and and Sylvie embraces nothing to to an almost deadly extent she says mm -hmm. well you're allowed to do that you can opt out and this is this is the only power that I can conceive of available to me at the moment and that's the power that she takes even though ultimately um she says at one point the circle that I've drawn around myself has become a noose because she's the one that suffers um but it takes a long time for her to realize that um that she can step back into her voice and that there are, are other modes of power available to her I was going to ask you that actually there's a lot of King Lear in the novel and <laughs> what what was the significance of that are you a are you a secret King Lear stan? I don't think it's secret now. I mean, <laughs> um, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a Shakespeare scholar at all. I'm just um, just a fan. Um, I I just remember being very very a, a bit. I mean, not unlike Sylvie, just astonished by the power of negation in mm -hmm. in what Cordelia does. So I could understand how Sylvie could seize on that and and all the bluster and speechifying that goes on with Lear and everyone around him and the other daughters and that simple thing of nothing, mm -hmm. nothing will come of nothing, nothing, my Lord. It's so absolute and simple, um, but it has, it has more power than anything else. The, the huge violence in King Lear, it isn't storm, it isn't Lear going mad, it isn't even the gouging out of eyes. It's, it's that silence which cuts away at everything. Um, so I was I was fascinated by that silence, but that is what makes Sylvie tricky to encapsulate in terms of her voice because there's silence at the heart of it, at least at the beginning. So she's kind of emerging gradually into her voice as the novel progresses. Yeah, I agree with you. I would say the eye gouging has a little bit of power. I would say for me, there's at least, <laughs> there's at least a little bit. If you tired of that power. I'll allow that, but I still think that, that the nothing is the secret violence at the heart of that, that play. Yeah. 
Um, so we've talked a lot about the kind of darkness in the novel. And whilst the novel is obviously based around a death in the family, for me, I think there are really funny moments in it as well. That sounds like a terrible thing to say because we've just talked about, you know, these really dark things. But there is warmth, there is humour, there is real love with the family. And you've said before that you think, we've talked a bit about duty already, this idea that you had a duty to pare- uh, portray anorexia in a way that you know made sure you were never glamorizing the illness and that you were kind of getting inside her her kind of mind and how she felt about her illness and the effect it had on everyone we've also talked about the duty a writer has to not just present grief and move on and be like great you guys deal with that but to actually kind of show a way through grief and how did you go about this when you were writing the novel how did you take such a you know heartbreaking thing the death of a child um, and move beyond that and show how the family can move beyond that. There are sort of two, two strands to this because on the one hand, I, I do feel that really quite strongly that there is a responsibility on the part of the writer because it's, it's a bit easy to do otherwise. Yeah. I think if you're, if you're even broadly competent as a writer, you can create a very sad scenario and you can evoke some characters and then you can kind of poke people in the tender places of their heart and provoke a reaction and that's that's not particularly difficult necessarily. I mean, it, it's not nothing, but um, I don't think that there's necessarily much complexity or interest in doing that. And in some ways it can feel very cheap, yeah. um, and exploitative. It, it can feel a bit like if a writer just puts all their, all this darkness on the page and, and asks the reader to come with them into a very dark place and doesn't offer them anything else, it feels a bit like sort of inviting someone into your house and then flicking off the lights and running away. And, and I'm not interested in that as a creative project. Yeah. Um, not that I feel any obligation to provide happy endings um, mm-hmm. at all, but I, I am interested in the processes of hope um, because I think it's more complex and more interesting than despair. So um, it, it was important to me that when I'm talking about a dead son and a, a very nearly dead daughter, you know, a really critically ill daughter in an awful situation, that that it not just be a big um, circle jerk of despair and self-pity and, and that I not just wallow in that. And also, why would people want to read that book? What yeah, would that yeah, offer yeah. To my readers? Um, so while I felt that very strongly, um, I actually didn't find it um, difficult because I was so drawn to those moments of light. And also because I find that they're the most authentic things, the kind of very black jokes. Mm. Um, and, and in my own experience of, um, of grief and bereavement, um, the human experience is never just in one shade. And, and there's always jokes, sometimes grossly inappropriate jokes when you're really in the thick of something terrible that's happening. Um, and it's never not been like that for me. So I will, um, I would claim that there are some cracking jokes in this book. It's funny, it's definitely um, funny. But it, which feels quite odd because, you know, dead kid, nearly dead second kid. Um, but, but it is really important, I think, because the, it's not a book about grief. Something terrible happens and there's this scenario and, and decisions are made that um, are, are clearly not wise decisions, but they're made in extremis. And then I'm interested in how this family that does love each other. They're all completely screwed up, but they love each other deeply and there's real happiness in amongst the dysfunction. How they try to, to find their way out and they don't always succeed and what happens and what I offer is not necessarily a neat ending or a perfectly happy ending. And there is no resurrecting the dead. I think the sort of absolute incommensurability of death is, is quite an important theme of the novel, but the living go on. Mm. And, and part of that going on involves humour and dad jokes and sex and passion and mistakes and reminiscences and, and things that that I hope lead a way out of all that grief. So I'm aware that sometimes when I pitch this novel and people ask me for the kind of 20 minute elevator pitch, it does sound a bit gloomy. And then there's what I think is quite a good joke, <laughs> bang on the middle of the, you know, the Teddy's first section. Um, and and I think it's really important that there's, there is a lot of joy in many ways. Um, in many ways, it's the most uplifting book I've written, despite the scattering of, of deaths throughout mm. it. No, definitely. I think it's a novel that to me felt very hopeful. It's not about a family kind of splintering. It's almost how they come back together yeah. after such a terrible thing that happens to them. I mean, I'm sure that uh, 
uh, the sun wouldn't be like, yeah, it was worth me dying because actually everyone came back after me. Uh, but it is, it's, 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 it's yeah. It does. Yeah, I took one for the team. I uh, brought everyone back together. Um, but you can see how actually with his death, I think as well, it provokes in Sylvie this realisation that actually opting out isn't as simple as just opting out. As Teddy says, you know, when someone's dead, they keep on being dead. You know, every single day this has to go on. And for Sylvie, I think there's a realisation of, oh, <laughs> you know, each each day I have to make a commitment to opt out and that becomes perhaps more more challenging. And the relationships between siblings are really interesting to me. I love books with siblings in. I'm a big fan of anything with twins or, you know, big families or anything like that. And I, I think you portray the sibling relationships really effectively. And I know you have um, a sister and a brother yourself. Do you have any favourite books about siblings? Um. I think the fire sermon books are very good on. Never heard of him. Don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean clearly it's a preoccupation of mine as well, having written three novels previously about about twins and their relationship. Um, I there is a little tribute in this book to two books that that I think do it really beautifully. Um, and actually, when I went out to um, to book bar to sign those books today, I was chatting with Chrissy, the lovely owner of that bookshop, and. Um, and we were chatting about pairings of books, and I and I mentioned these two books then because they're they're so dear to me. And um, they're they're two books that I always recommend in a pair. It's it's um, we've always lived in the castle by Shirley Jackson, which I've mentioned already. So that was in my head down in the boneyard as as the working title of this novel when I had started it. Um, and and the relationship between the the sisters there and the brilliant um, narrative voice. Um, of that that young girl, which is so hard to do, and not be twee or cheesy or patronising or too precocious. Um, so that one, and hand in hand with that, um, I capture the castle by Dodie Smith, and they're essentially the same book, but one is in a minor and one is in a major key. They're about sisters growing up in weird, big, old, dilapidated houses with shenanigans going on, but one is really bleak and gothic and. Um, almost a you know a psychological thriller and the other one is, is sort of beautifully light and um and romantic and swoony um but at the heart of both of them I think is a relationship between siblings so it's it's maybe not obvious but the cave system in which Dougie sadly dies in the the freak caving accident is called the Smith Jackson cave system oh my gosh and I didn't know that so my favorite pairing of, of that's so books. funny yeah. I love but I love both of those books those are two of my favorites actually and um I'd never thought of it that way that one is in a major key and one is in a minor key I mean very interesting relationship between siblings they've got one that's very murdery yep and then one that's kind of big loving eccentric um, isn't, that, isn't that how it goes aren't they the two extremes because growing up with siblings it's very much they're your best friend and your boon companion. You can spend hours and long holidays playing with them. And then also you absolutely, I mean, I broke my brother's collarbone when I was 18 months old. Um, I began my life of crime early and, um, and he probably deserved it. Um, so, you know, very few things are as intense as that formative relationship. Yeah. And so yeah. it's, it's provided a lot of fuel for, for fiction and, um, and hopefully including, including my own because the relationship that Teddy and Sylvie and Dougie have is one of great, you know, there's a lot of, of dismissiveness and grumpiness. There's a moment when Teddy, who's a rather sweet 11 year old, realizes that, um, that Santa isn't real and he, he confides this secret to his big brother, Dougie, and Dougie's answer is just kind of, yeah, no shit, Sherlock. And there's that kind of very everyday, prosaic yeah. siblings bumping along, but there's also this huge well of tenderness that Dougie, he's a bit of a lad and quite a cool guy before he dies, but he, he writes to his hospitalized sister almost every week from his gap year. So there's there's real tenderness as well as that competitiveness and aggression and fury. So it's such a it's such a rich well for an author. Definitely, definitely. And it's it's nice, I think, to have that kind of lightness and that levity and humor in their relationship because I think it it's realistic. And I, I think Teddy's voice is very charming. He's a he's a lovely kind of ray of light in the novel because obviously this terrible thing has happened which I think at that age you can't quite get your head around mortality like you understand the idea of someone dying but the idea that they'll never come back that feels very very final and I think that's slightly 
beyond him for a while. Yeah, I mean, we had a we had a very sad bereavement of a beloved friend to, to whom the book is dedicated, and and I was struggling to deal with that and going through that process of grieving while while my own son was very young. And one day I got a bit teary and I said, "I'm sorry, you know, I, I just still get a bit upset when I think about why um, why Uncle James died." And Max, who was then you know four and had been you know as sympathetic as a four year old could be, said very impatiently, you know why he died, mummy, he fell down the stairs. Um, so for him, it was a question of mechanics, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. An essential question. And obviously Teddy, you know, Teddy's a bright 11 um, year old, but he's also in some ways quite sheltered and shielded. And um, he spends most of his time with his increasingly senile grandfather, Papa B. So um, his understanding of his brother's death is, um, is incomplete. And, and he's still slightly prone to magical thinking. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a huge challenge because I can't stand a twee child narrator. That's a, a real pet hate of mine. And, and I think if you get children wrong, it's so cringeworthy and awful. Um, so um, I wanted Teddy to be a bit weird and, and fresh and youthful and in some ways innocent, but never to be twee or whimsical because it's deadly in earnest for him. Yeah, and he of course. To find out his sister's secret. And he's convinced that that will bring the family together. And for him, this is as real as, as anything else. So um, I had to do the, the narrator brief for the audio book um, before it was recorded. Um, and, and I really wrote a long essay to, to the narrator, who's the brilliant Australian actress, Sancia Robinson. Um, and, I, and I wrote when they asked me to give briefing notes, this whole spiel about, please, God, don't make Teddy Twee, don't do a cutesy voice. Yeah, he's yeah, yeah. 11, but he's not a dumb kid and he's not an idiot. Um, and it was so important to me. Um, and she's done a terrific job. Um, but kids is tough because you can so easily skew kids. I know, I know completely what you mean. It's something that I say often that I hate books with child narrators, but actually I represent quite a lot of books with child narrators, but they're the exceptions. Like when they're done well, it's just glorious. And it's it's such a kind of... With Teddy, it was about letting the weirdness in. There was a yeah. moment when I'd written him just as kind of a younger adult. And there was a moment when I was writing and, and you know, Jill, Jill writes these increasingly um, bizarre recipes as mm -hmm. she starts to, to lose her... Um, connection with reality and, and when she hears the news of her son's death she she writes this recipe for you know an omelette upon receiving news of your eldest child's death and it's sort of you know crack crack a dozen egg, large eggs preferably free range at room temperature carefully separate the eggs and yolks throw them away um and and Teddy's watching this go on and he and he said this line um he says when an egg cracks is it broken or is it coming true and, and I think I emailed you and said, I've got it, I've got Teddy's voice. It's just about letting the weirdness in a bit because he has these little musings and speculations. Um, and the more I allowed myself to open up to the kind of weirdness and, and true strangeness of Teddy's voice and his imaginings, it, it really came to life. Um, mm -hmm. Well, so I, think, I think you do. Online. Yeah, I think you do a great job with him. And I think that his relationship with Papa B as well with his, his grandfather is really very very moving and again a kind of lovely very sad but kind of warm part of the novel too well that's a double risk isn't it because the uh, the other way you can easily skew very cutesy and sentimental is with an elderly character it can so easily <laughs> depict it in a patronizing way and I, I have to come clean I say this is not an autobiographical novel it very much isn't but one two characters I just snitched pretty much straight from life and they are Papa B who's based on my gorgeous late grandfather who was known to everyone you know, family and friends and the people at the bank as grandfather. He was a rather formal old <laughs> gent. And he, he grew really quite senile during the years that he lived um, near us. And um, that was a wonderful man. And so a lot of Papa B's best lines of snitch from, from grandfather. And the other character that I, I stole wholesale was um, the sausage dog. So um, they're the only two. <laughs> So yeah, Papa B and Teddy have a very special bond. And I think there has to be, you have to let the light in at some points otherwise a book with a topic potentially as dark as mine would be unreadable and yeah it's... absolutely absolutely I was going to ask actually because you know you're you're someone who is you know you're very funny you're going to love this you know you're very funny oh, you're very warm etc 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 um so was it challenging writing something that in points 
is very dark. I mean, writing, to, the, the death of someone's child is a taboo, you know, that whole thing, it's, you know, parents should never have to bury their child. So, so was it difficult for you to put yourself in that mindset of what, what, what it would be like to, to lose a child? Um, yeah, I think, I think it is. And I do tend to, uh, my, my natural personality is probably annoyingly chipper and, and bubbly. Um, and it, it is a bit of a weird one because I've, you know, I've written this novel. I wrote three very bleak post-apocalyptic novels beforehand. My PhD was on Holocaust literature. Um, <laughs> and yet I am this kind of gobby Aussie lass who loves a joke. Um, I, I don't think it was hard to go there though because I was curious. And so even though it might not be my natural metier to sort of, to go gloomy, I'm curious. And and as a writer, you're always curious about the, ex the extremes of human emotions. Yeah. So, um, of course, you're drawn to those dark places. And there's such an unnatural thing. I mean, all grief is absolute. And I, I'm always really wary of any, I hate when people sort of play the now I'm a parent card. <laughs> um, as if there's, there's great levels of wisdom and profundity and love that are only available to those who've, who've become parents. And I've always, you know, I, I love my son deeply, but um, I don't think I'm necessarily wiser or better. I'm just more tired and my handbag is full of wet wipes. It's, <laughs> I've always resisted this sort of special narrative surrounding parents, but there is a kind of wrongness to the natural order when, um, mm -hmm. when a parent buries their child that's so grim that you do almost resist trying it on for size. I think we all try on other people's tragedy for size mentally. We mm -hmm. test it out and we have a little prod and, and think, oh God, how awful, how would that feel? And there's a place where I don't even really want to go um, when I think about me, but when I'm thinking about characters, I'm absolutely hungry for that. I want, I want to try that on and imagine and to understand because it's the, those extremes of human feeling that are the juiciest. That's probably why there's such a huge appetite in crime fiction. You know, the crime thriller readership is predominantly women. And I, I always find it interesting when there are these debates about, you know, like books in which terrible, terrible things happen to women. And it's almost like, yeah, but we're reading it because it's a safe way of exploring something that we're all terrified of happening. And, and maybe that's a little bit of it for you as well in this novel or for the readers as well, that's like, well, oh, there, but for the grace of God, go I. What's it like kind of reading about it happening to someone else, but but hoping it will um, it will never happen for us. So we've got about 15 minutes left. So um, I've got some questions coming in and if anyone has any questions they want to ask, um, Chess, for example, where did she get her lovely zebra pajamas from? And uh, then to just <laughs> drop them in the um, Q and A box. But there were a couple of other things I wanted to ask um, as well, and and one of them was which of the voices was your favourite to write? I'm getting the sense it was maybe Teddy, but maybe oh, I no, I, I love Teddy, but actually, in some ways, my favourite my favourite voice is a character that doesn't have their own narrative chapters because they're a minor character but um jill has a best friend called sue who is a source of great hilarity and she's just a she she is in fact um jill's literary agent and she's a huge character and a great support but very very blunt and funny um and and cracks off color jokes probably too soon um, after <laughs> these, these terrible events and she's a real part of their family um, and I loved writing the scenes where Sue and Jill are sitting on the balcony having a gin and tonic. Mm. Um, so even though it, it didn't fit for Sue to have her own voice because she's not at the heart of the narrative, I loved Sue um, and, and her voice came so naturally um, to me. In terms of the, the main characters, I think, I think it probably is Teddy. I mean, Sylvie and Gabe and Jill all felt, they all came more easily in some ways than Teddy because he was so different from me and Sylvie was difficult but I had shared elements of that experience but I've never been an 11 year old boy and mm. so um Teddy was was probably my favorite and I do feel a slight I suppose as a mother of a young boy I do feel a slight maternal affection towards this this lad who is in many ways quite badly neglected by his loving family. yeah like completely neglected poor thing that he's just, just kind of yeah so it's a little afterthought bless him that yeah, it's like absolutely. so much is going on with his siblings but I feel like maybe um you know Teddy will get his own novel at some point Ted Teddy's gonna like go completely rogue and it will be like we've always we need to talk about Kevin <laughs> we'll be like in a school shooting <laughs> 
It may be a total spin off in the broader cookbook of common prayer cinematic universe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, our, our own kind of Marvel universe. Um, so we've got some uh, some great questions coming in. Uh, possibly the most important question, will we get hungry reading the book? Um, I hope so. You know, Jill's Jill's recipes are a bit weird at the start, but um, but she is also a really good writer and I and it's not elaborate stuff. Um mm -hmm. It's stuff that I that I cook and enjoy, and so I don't know if, if people will feel moved to follow the recipes. and And I want to warn, I, I want to reassure people that there aren't great big screeds of recipe. They're kind of little snatches of recipe here and there. So, you know, my brother is not a particularly keen cook, and he was really pleasantly surprised when he read it. He was really honest and said, "I thought the recipe stuff would be boring, but you know, um, it fitted in, and there wasn't too much." So. Um, I'll be curious. Uh, tweet me or let me know if you if you cook any of the recipes yourself. But some of them rely on good Tasmanian seafood. It wouldn't be the same with mussels from Sainsbury's over here in London. Yeah, that's that's very true. Someone's asked an interesting question, which I disagree with. You've said very little about the father. So is he a bit sidelined in the book? I think we've maybe been unfair because a lot of his his strand is perhaps the most dynamic in the book because he is kind of investigating. Yeah, I mean, in some ways, I've I've been a little bit wary of touching too much on Gabe, the father, because I I, I want to be a bit spoiler cautious. There are, yeah, there are a lot of spoilers in his strand. Yeah. I mean, Gabe, Gabe, Gabe is very dear to my heart, and I have perhaps neglected him a bit today, um, because his response to the loss of the child is so different from Jill's, and I don't think it's it's too spoiler tastic to say, you know, Jill throws herself into this elaborate lie that that Sylvie is. Um, uh, for, for Sylvie's sake, that Dougie is still alive and begins writing these letters. But Gabe is over in London. He stays in London and he's trying to do research for the upcoming inquest into his mm -hmm. son's death. And because he's a scientist, he naturally um, wants to sort of arrive at some kind of quantitative understanding of what has happened to his son. So he becomes very obsessed with like the physical and medical minutiae of his son's injuries and the um, logistics of flash flooding and caving and meteorology um, but he also develops this relationship with his um, his late son's girlfriend who was there at the time so there is a real um, investigative story there about trying to find out what actually happened in the cave and those last moments and also he he knows the cave about the cave guide who took his son into the cave and failed to to rescue him so um, that has a, a relatively dramatic thread where um, he's trying to think of how to how to deal with the knowledge that this man is alive and his son is is not perhaps because of this man. Um, so there is a lot to Gabe and, and I have perhaps been unjust in in not talking about him more. He's actually one of my my dearly beloved characters because he he has quite a, a goodness to him in his. He's a great character. He yeah. really he really yeah. is. But, but like Jill, he's a, he's a good person making atrocious decisions and, and we can understand why those decisions are made. And I hope they're not implausible in the context of, of the um, situation in the book, but they're definitely bad decisions, um, but their consequences are, are so interesting. Oh, yeah, definitely. Like it, it, wouldn't, side line, side it, wouldn't be, I, it wouldn't be a very interesting novel if everyone made really good choices and... <laughs> like why does this happen well it needs to happen for they all them. went to therapy and uh, and yeah, yeah exactly exactly and they they kind of got over everything together and so someone's our secret and lies seem to be a theme of your story and secrets and lies seem to be the story of many families in real life why do you think that is well I'm interested above all in the lies that we tell to ourselves so I think that's that's the the core of this lie that the lie is ostensibly for Sylvie, but I don't think it's it's spoiling the novel to say that that um, that really the lie serves Jill and and to a lesser extent Gabe, um, because I think we tell lies all the time, but the ones the really dangerous ones are the the lies that we we tell to ourselves. Mm. Um, so they were the ones that I was interested in unpicking here. Um, but lies again are fantastic meat for a writer, aren't they? I mean, I don't eat meat, but. Um, but I is like that quote, isn't, isn't it? Like um, every happy family 
is alike but every unhappy family is unhappy in their own way and I think that makes for so much kind of rich dramatic fodder to to kind of look in on that unhappiness and and discover what's uh, what's beneath the surface. Uh, someone's asked did you think of a particular character or narrator first when the novel was in the early stages or did the family arrive almost as a whole? Um, no I thought about the anorexic daughter and that dilemma and then as a way of kind of upping the stakes for what was already a fairly horrible dilemma the the elder son um, um, came to me and and Jill and her response came very quickly because of the, the link to food and, and the anorexic daughter and that interesting dynamic about having a food writer with a daughter who doesn't eat. Teddy and, it, and in fact, Dougie um, came sort of in unison later on um, and emerged, but, but Jill was, was a very strong voice from the start. Mm. Um, Jill and Sylvie, even though it took time to capture Sylvie's voice, I knew who they were, I just couldn't express them perfectly at first. Mm -hmm. Did you I ever find out Paul Gabe again? He was there, I did care about him. No, well, I was about to say, did you ever find yourself wishing that Dougie could have still been alive so you could write him? Because obviously we only ever see Dougie through his mother's kind of weird pretense that she is him. Yeah, well, we see Dougie, there are actual letters from Dougie in the start, including one that was sent just before he died that's discovered after his death. So we catch a few glimpses of Dougie's voice. And then as Jill starts to ventriloquize Dougie's voice, um, that becomes our main access to Dougie. Um, and again, I had a really interesting, I was prompted to think really carefully about this when I was writing the narrator brief for the audio book, because they, they were talking about, you know, what accents. And I had to think about what, what voice should she do for the letters that Jill has written. Um, and ultimately I decided, and, and I felt quite strongly that it had to be the same, that for Jill, at least, those voices become indistinguishable. And that's, that's why it's so real to her, because she starts to believe in these letters that she writes, so that the Dougie and the letters that, that she produces are as real. And certainly for the reader, that that's the Dougie that we get to know. So for us, of course, they're as real. And there's an interesting point of who owns these letters at the end, it comes up, you know, do they belong ultimately to Sylvie, whom they were sent to as, a, as part of this um, deception? Do they belong to Jill? Do they in some way belong to, to Dougie, even though he's dead? Because they are, Jill's a good writer. She's, yeah. she's a, a skilled writer, that's her living, and she ventriloquizes her son very effectively. At least I hope it's she such, it, It's such an interesting question, because of course, the version, that the voice you're going to give to this, person is very different even if you can mimic them to some extent there's probably going to be a tendency to want to iron out their bad qualities or you know make them kind of more loving in a way towards their family or or and whatever course, it Sylvie, is. Sylvie who's receiving these letters is hugely intelligent as well yeah. so she's more perceptive than, than people give her credit for initially when they're all caught up in, the, in their own grief so that's not lost on her. Mm -hmm, definitely. Someone's asked, how did you come up with the title and can you explain it? Um, it was one of the titles on a shortlist which included some real shockers. I love, I've come up with some really <laughs> bad titles for my book over the years, but luckily I'm in the hands of very good publishers. Um, so it, it was a, a, a title that was tossed around and I was initially slightly concerned that perhaps people would think it was a cookbook or think it was some religious tract or that they would think it was a kind of self-help book, chicken soup for the soul book, which no shade on those books, but that's not what this novel is. Mm -hmm. um, but my, my brilliant editor um, and um, publicist um, and marketing people at um, Alan and Unwin sort of came back and said they felt that this was the one. And I had an initial, I mean, you would have received the email, Juliet, when I was like, ah, oh, everyone's gonna think it's a cookbook. Is this a disaster? Here's 20 more increasingly terrible options that you might <laughs> consider instead. Uh, but then as is usual for me, as you've learned, I then calmed down the next day and realized that um, it was a, it's a good title. The only thing I do wonder is that outside the English and perhaps Australian colonial tradition where the, the Book of Common Prayer is, um, familiar to, to mm. most people, largely speaking. So um, that's a known entity. And so the little, the play on that, the cookbook of common prayer is evident. I don't know how an American reader might perceive that title, um, but that's a problem for another day. 
Um, someone's asked, do you still think about the book's characters and what would have been happening to them in life after the period of the book? And if so, is there a character in particular? Um, I think about Teddy. I think perhaps with that maternal instinct and because he's the youngest, he's got more ahead of him. I can sort of see where the others are going. And for Teddy, it remains it remains more open. So I do. I mean, I, it's very un-British and, and very un-Australian to, to admit to to sort of being very proud of a book or, or caring for the characters in your book. But this book was really very personal, not in an autobiographical sense, but just that I felt it very deeply and I, and I cared very deeply for these characters and for the issues that were um, discussed in it. So I, I do think about it with, um, with great fondness and, and love really, cheesy as that sounds, particularly for Teddy. I sort of have these moments when when I think about what he goes through and, and perhaps slightly conflating him with my own gorgeous little kid and, and think, oh, Teddy, you know. Um, mm. But I think Teddy will be okay without me. Okay, I think you'll be okay. That's a, that's a very positive note for us to end on. So um, thank you so much, uh, Francesca, for being so generous with your time and giving me so many interesting answers to my questions. Yeah. Just before um, we go, can I quickly say some thank yous because I'll kick myself mm. if I haven't. Um, I, I really do want to thank as, um, as well as various family and friends who, who read early drafts um, and really significantly helped um, to improve the book. Um, my, my absolutely brilliant editor, Kate Ballard at Alan and Unwin, who has just been so insightful and got the book from the start. Um, and it's just been a joy to work with her. Um, and also my fantastic publicist, um, Kirsty Dahl, and um, in marketing, Amy Oliver Powell, who've just been terrific, and all the team. And, and I know that um, you're right there, Juliet, but Juliet as, as an agent and um, someone who's had faith in this book, even when I sometimes lost it, has been um, absolutely peerless. So thank you very much to um, to Kate, Kirsty, Amy and, and Juliet and to, to all those others who helped you know who you are. And thank you to, to all of you for coming along tonight. Oh, well, that's a really lovely note to end on. So yes, thank you everyone for coming along. Um, and the book is available now from all good bookshops. <laughs>